Well, it may be gloomy outside, but it cannot rain out Mother's Day. Just like I want to echo what everyone else has been saying in service. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to our grandmothers, mothers, birth mothers, mothers of our children, and those who long to be mothers. We celebrate with you today. Hey, if it's your first time here or you're new here, my name's Tyler Goodall. I'm the director of Next Generation here at Littleton Church of Christ. And these two weeks are a special week for us. Uh, it's two weeks in the season of our church, in the season of the next generation. Uh, wasn't it so wonderful to celebrate child dedication just a few minutes ago? And then next week, I love how we do this here, we will be celebrating our graduating seniors who will be leaving high school and heading off. So it's, it's a special season, but uh, because of that and because of how much we care at this church for the next generation... I want to bring us a message uh, directly centering around this. So I don't know about any of you, but having children changed me, okay? Uh, I've started to notice these things, that I see the world differently than I did before. Let me give you a few examples. Here's the first one. So before children, I wanted to climb all the 14ers, okay? I had been working hard on that, but there's this 14er called capital, and this is a picture of what's called the knife edge. You have to straddle the knife edge, and it's hundreds of feet down on either side. Pre-children, I really wanted to climb this. Post-children, I have no desire. In fact, I have promised my wife that I will not climb it until the children leave the house. Our very own David Fees, who's climbed them all, he's climbed this mountain three times, so he's gone back and forth six times on this ledge. Um, and it's just a little scary to me, you know? I don't know if my life insurance policy covers that. Here's, here's another example. Sleeping in, okay? Like, going to work used to be the first thing I would do in my day. I'd wake up, and I'd just, hey, here's work. Let's get the day going. Now, by the time I go to work, I feel like I've already lived half of my day, right, at that point. And the creepiest thing is the alarm clock that children pro provide. The scariest one is the crying in the middle of the night, the jumping up. But maybe even a little bit more terrifying is when they sneak into your room and they get this far away from your face and they're like, good morning, daddy. And, and you know, you don't know if it's your child or if it's Chucky and it's kind of a scary moment. And the last thing is personal space. Okay, my daughter loves to brush her teeth. I think it's a great quality. But one day, she chose to brush her teeth with my toothbrush, which is revolting to me. I already have saliva issues. I'm kind of a germ freak. And to see her doing that, it's just like when you have children, there is no boundary that they aren't willing to cross, and it teaches you those lessons. But most of all, what I want to say to you today is I think what has happened to me as I've become a parent is I've learned to read the Bible differently. Um, the way that I see it, the way that I view it, the characters that stand out to me, it just makes all the difference. So uh, our, the student ministry on Wednesday nights, we've been growing through the series, The Chosen. I know many of you have been watching The Chosen series. I've had great conversations with you about it. If you haven't watched it yet, download the app, find it on YouTube. Uh, you're missing out if you haven't. Basically what it is, is it's each week or each uh, series uh, in episodes, focus, focuses on a small section of scripture. And then they put a story around it of the people who are chosen and what it might have been like for them to follow Jesus, things that they have uh, maybe potentially gone through. So we've been watching that series and been having some great discussions, but we were watching the scene where Jesus called Peter, you know, the miracle of the fish, and it's overwhelming the boats. And there was a small section of that scene that stood out to me. Let me share that with you right now. You as well. Yes, you, James and John, come, follow me. I'll take the fish into market and settle up Simon's death. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> We've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> Go, now. What's been haunting me since I watched this clip was Zebedee's reaction. 
that when his sons are called, that he would be met with that much excitement and joy to send them out to follow Jesus. See, as long as I've been here, church, we've said every Sunday that our vision is to reach the next generation while being transformed into his likeness. And so, church, we've talked much about what it might take to raise up our children in the Lord. But today I want to ask the question, what if it works? What if actually everything comes together and that is actually taking place? How would we respond in that moment? So let's pray about that before we go any farther. Heavenly Father, we seek to bring your kingdom to the earth. We seek the, for followers and believers uh, and Christians of all generations to know of your goodness and your love and your mercy. So as we seek to instill this in our children and our children's children, I pray that you would pour through me the gift of preaching that Christ may be formed in hearts. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be able to see the words anew and hear them afresh as we learn about this mystery of raising our kids up in the Lord. I pray these in your name. Amen. So as I said earlier, I want to dive into this text a little bit. Peter, uh, Jesus has just performed this incredible miracle for Peter. He saved him. Uh, he has gotten him out of trouble. He calls Peter the rock of the church one day to follow him. And then there's this line. Let's look at uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, starting in verse 19. When he had gone a little farther... He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat. Preparing their nets without delay, he called them, and they left their family, or they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the, the hired men and followed him. So let's explore a little bit about Zebedee. What do we know about Zebedee? Well, He's very, mentioned very little in Scripture, actually, uh, only in the synoptic Gospels and the calling of his sons. This text in Mark that we just looked at gives us actually the most detailed description, and it's believed that he was a successful fisherman because he had some means to hire other help. Yet Zebedee here makes this incredible statement of faith for his family. So let's think about some of the implications that Zebedee would have had for his children following Jesus. Well, first, he, instead of having his sons to work, who probably lived with him and lived in the house and expenses were lower, he had to hire help. So surely that came at some expense. James and John no longer held full-time jobs. So I wonder if Zebedee ever asked the question about their finances. I wonder if he ever thought to themselves, I'm out here working to support my sons while they gallivant around with Jesus. We don't know of his, his sons ever being married or ever having children. However, we certainly know it was a great honor to have your sons to be called by a rabbi. But the wife of Zebedee, Salome, stirs things up when she asks James and John later on to be seated on the right hand or either side of Jesus when he takes his place on his throne, which maybe isn't the greatest text to bring up on Mother's Day. But certainly it seems that Zebedee was excited when his sons left to follow Jesus. But I have to wonder if Zebedee and Salome ever had questions or doubts after that moment. I mean, think about when the crowds threatened their son or when the Pharisees and the Sadducees tried to convict them. Were Zebedee and Salome ever worried over their, over their son's safety? Salome was listed at one of the, as one of the women at the cross when Jesus was crucified. And I wonder if she ever had any questions about that in his kingdom. And we know nothing of Zebedee at the crucifixion. Where was he at that moment? Had he had died? Was he out working? Did he have questions about Jesus and his kingdom? Do you uh, think that these get to see and they got, ever got to see their, hear, or hear their children spread the good news of Jesus around the world? Do you think that Zebedee and Salome ever got to read their son John's writings? Do you think they were devastated to hear that King Herod had James put to death by the sword? And do you think they ever missed John when he was exiled to the island of Padmos? See, following Jesus had great implications for this family. And when I was younger, I would marvel at the faith of James and John. And I would mar but now, today, as I'm older, I marvel at, marvel at the faith of Zebedee and Salome. 
The cost of following Jesus had major implications for them, and in part because of the faithfulness of these parents and children, you and I have faith today. You know, it's very common in our world today for uh, especially sports stars, for them to talk about their parents and to talk about the sacrifices that their parents made and all the lengths that they went to to make them a star. And then they like to find them on the television and find them in the crowd and see the reaction as their child fails or as their child succeeds. And they like to live in those moments. And when those families are successful, they like to post the pictures of them on the stage. But I don't know about you. I would much rather hear from and look at and uh, watch from a distance parents like Zebedee and Salome in order to learn how they successfully raised up their children in the Lord. And all this leads me to a hard question today. See, if following Jesus is the top priority for my children, then am I okay if my children never get married or give me grandchildren? Am I okay if they're never financially independent? Am I okay if their safety isn't guaranteed or even if one day they are persecuted? See, I heard a Church of Christ college minister say once that there are two types of parents that call a college minister. The first type is probably the type that comes to mind is the parent who wants their child to have more faith in Jesus. That says, my child has made poor decisions. My child has stepped away. They're not following God. What are they doing? Can you help me? Can you reach out to them? Can you invite them to Bible study? Can you do those things? But this college minister said there's another type. There's actually the type that calls because their children are following Jesus a little too much. And they say, hey, I don't know if they should go on this mission trip. I don't know if they should pick this major. I don't know if they should do this with their life. Could you just kind of tell them to tone it down? And Javon has spoken several times about his experience with his calling and family and friends who had questions about it. And I think just about anyone who goes into ministry, including myself, can share some of those feelings. And when I look back on my time at a Christian college, some of the saddest moments for me were actually when my friends sitting around eating and hanging out had to change their major because mom and dad didn't approve of it. They wanted something more practical. They wanted to go on that mission trip and parents said it was too dangerous. They wanted to be a missionary, but that just didn't seem practical or safe. And those were the hard struggles and doubts that we lamented, that that we saw people go through. And so this all leads me to the question of how is God working in our children's hearts today? So let me give you one example. A former student who grew up in this church made a series of bad decisions. These bad decisions ended up landing him in prison. And so Mike told me, as you know Mike would say, you never give up on anyone. And he told me about it, and so I scheduled a meeting. So I would go meet with this student about once a month, and we would have a Bible study together. And this student reminded me that the first time I called and asked him, or the first time we met in the study, he responded to me with, who the blank are you? And the blank is edited out there, which is always a great way to study or start a Bible study, right? Let's talk about Jesus. It was a four-letter word, but it wasn't Mark, Luke, or John, okay? And so we kept on studying. We'd studied for, for a month, and, and uh, he got out of prison, and, and things did not go as planned. But last Sunday, I got an unexpected call. I was worried. I thought something had happened to this student. I thought that he was maybe uh, in danger or was going through another crisis, but instead this student called and said how much God was working in his life. He said he was living with another graduate from our youth group. And this graduate had invited him to church. They had been attending church together. And he said things like, every sermon is meant, is is like it's written just for me. And he talked about family and friends calling him and having all these deep conversations with him. He, He talked about how he was about to call the preacher, but he was just too nervous. And five minutes later, the preacher happened to call him. 
And he called me, apologizing to me and others and thanking us for the role that we had in instilling faith in his life. And church, I'm happy to share with you today this video that the, from the decision that ben, Ma- ben Wagner made last Wednesday. Hey, first of all, I want to <clears throat> just thank the Littleton Church of Christ, the youth group, our good friends throughout the years, and all the people that have influenced Ben, Charlie and Manny, who kept up the steadfastness on Ben. And uh, I know that Ben's a plotter. He's a longtime thinker, and he really thinks this stuff out, hence the many, many years he's thought about this. So to me and to his mother, we know this is the right time for him. He's thought about it. He loves Jesus. And he's at the end of this journey, this final road. And I just want to say that this is a road that doesn't end, but the journey begins, Ben. For everlasting life. Are you ready to become a Christian? Yeah. And claim the Lord Jesus as your Christ. Yeah. Ben, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yeah. Do you believe that he was sent to earth, died on the cross? And arose three days later. Yeah. Based on your confession, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, round of applause again for Ben. <clears throat> what a great time it was celebrating last Wednesday and, and hugging and crying and, and seeing this story come together and, and seeing God working. And so I think one of the questions we've asked church oftentimes during this past year is where is God at? And I want to remind you, God is still working in the world. God is still the good shepherd leaving the 99 to go find the one, just as he has done this past week in our midst. God is still working in the hearts of people. And I felt like with Ben that I was trying to be like Zebedee, just getting out of the way and say, follow Jesus. Yes, follow Jesus. And so we came down here in the worship center church and we circled around and we prayed over Ben. And I want to show you a picture of what I think victory looks like. This is the Wagner family praying. And we can show pictures of our kids succeeding in in academics or in sports or in theater or whatever those things might be. And those are good things. But ultimately, I think the best thing, the very best thing, the thing that feels better more than anything else, the thing that makes more of a difference is when our children make this commitment to follow Jesus. And that is what we long for and that is what we hope for and that is what we pray for. So I'm not sure, church, how good I am at this parenting thing. But here's my idea. You'll have to let me know after if you think it's a good idea or not. See, there's an anxious, ancient Jewish blessing that says, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And I love the implications of this blessing, that actually in following your rabbi, of course the road is dirty and weary, ministry is difficult, that you are covered in dust and dirt as you follow your Savior. But my hope is, for Aubrey and I, that we may be covered so much in the dust of our rabbi that it, won't, it can't help but rub off on our kids. And when that moment comes, that Jesus comes with a calling for their life, my hope, church, is that I would be filled more with faith than with fear, and I would be like Zebedee and say, this is what we have been praying for our entire lives. Go, follow Jesus. Go. Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. And so God, I thank you for the example of Zebedee and Salome. I thank you for the way that they instilled faith in their children. And God, we humbly come before you 
saying that we want to see faith passed on to the next generation here at Littleton Church of Christ. And we ask for your love and support and mercy through the power of your Holy Spirit in that. And God, if we are known for anything when this world is over, let us be known for the faith of our children, just like Zebedee and Salome. I pray these things in your name. Amen.